Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Tremendous success. 
My dua is that of Musa alayhi salam when he prayed, Oh my Lord, expand for me my chest, make easy for me my task, loosen the knot from my tongue so they understand my speech. Amin. It's an interesting weekend, the Sopranos. Right, Sunday marks Father's Day, as well as Juneteenth. Some of y'all looking surprised. Father's Day is this weekend? <laughs> Typical. I thought it was funny because I noticed uh, a mini barrage of social media posts saying, oh man, Father's Day and Juneteenth on the same day. We're not getting anything for Father's Day. Alhamdulillah. So I wanted to talk a little bit about fatherhood and recognition that we're upon Father's Day. And we've been talking about family anyway. And I wanted to talk a little bit about freedom since we're upon Juneteenth, which everyone in here should know by now. You know, uh, President Trump found out a year ago, so everyone else should already know. <laughs> June 19th represents the day when the last slaves in the United States of America uh, were actually emancipated. They found out they were free just a couple of years later uh, after the Emancipation Proclamation. And so it's been recognized in Texas for years uh, and it's been recognized amongst, in the black community, especially in the South, uh, for years. Uh, as a sort of informal holiday that was made formal or official a year ago. Um, first, I want to look at what do we know about fatherhood from an Islamic perspective. And fatherhood is tied inextricably to manhood. Those two roles are linked together. And the ayah that speaks to that is in Surah al Isa, ayah 34, where Allah says, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim." Al-rajal al-awwamun al-nisa bima fatul Allah ba'dhum ala ba'd wa bima antaqu min amwalihim. Salat Allah alim. Translated as men but some translators translated as husbands. Husbands or men should take good care of their wives. They are awamuna ala nisa. And from awamuna, this is a word that in its root implies strength and might. So using strength and might to take care, hence the idea of the men as being the protectors God has given to some more than others and that they spend out of their own money. If we look, take any kind of uh, anthropology course and look at the vast majority of human societies, you'll see in those societies that the power brokers in those societies are the men vastly male-dominated societies. The ones who are acquiring the wealth, the ones that are controlling access to the wealth, the ones who are distributing the wealth are the men. It's not hit or miss, 50-50. It's the overwhelming majority. When you don't see that case, it sticks out as an anomaly. Huh, it's interesting. This is different from the pattern. This verse indicates that there's something in that. This was by Allah's design. That men were given a certain advantage that allowed them to be the ones who can acquire power and wealth in a communal setting over women. But he says to have it and use it to the benefit of the women, not to yourselves. Taking care of their wives, spending on them,
In the English, I was saying, second part of it, I am righteous wives. And so righteous wives or women are devout and guard what the law would have them guard uh, in their husband's absence. A lot of times now, we have constructed this false dichotomy between men and women and set them up as enemies of each other, as opponents, as rivals, competing for power, competing for leadership, competing for importance within society, within the household, within the family dynamic. This was not, this is not in Allah's plan. This is a deviation from it. In Surah 92, in these beautiful Meccan ayahs, Allah says, I will be the name of the Shaytan of Rajim. Wallaymi idha yarsha. Wannahari idha tajadla. Wana khalaka dhakara wal unta. Inna sa'yakum la shatta. Salatullah al-Azim. Allah is making oaths and he's swearing by the night as it covers, and by the day, as it brightens, and by the spectacle creation of the male and the female. He says, your strivings are immensely diverse. And what's beautiful in this is that Allah is indicating the complementary nature of the man and the woman by putting it next to Night and day. As he swears by night and day, are night and day enemies of each other? Is one bad and one evil? Is even one better than the other? And some of you are sitting here thinking, well, I prefer. I like it better. He created the night for a purpose. He created the daytime for a purpose. And the alteration of them going back and forth, we wouldn't want a world where it was only night or a world where it was only daytime. Similarly, we don't want a community that's only men or one that's only women. We're here to complement each other if we understand who we are. So in that ayah, Allah is given an indication, men, you are the maintainers, the providers, the protectors. You are spending from what Allah has provided for you on your wives. This goes into the role of fatherhood. And thus the Prophet Sallallahu he says, he says to his community, men and women, he said, every single one of you is a shepherd and is questioned about his flock. The leader of a people is a guardian and is questioned about his subjects. Think about this. Those of us who desire leadership are those of us who assume leadership is automatically a prestigious position to be in. You will be questioned about it. It's a responsibility it's a burden. It's something not to be taken lightly. And being in a leadership position automatically does not make you good or virtuous or noble or special. We have the example of Pharaoh. He was not better than his wife, who was considered to be one of the perfect women. And he's considered to be the paragon of rebellion against the law in spite of his power and wealth, commanding an army, etc. Allah's uh, messenger is telling us, the leader of people is a guardian and is questioned about his subjects. He says, a man is the guardian of his family and is questioned about them. A woman is the guardian of her husband's home and his children, and she is questioned about them. A woman is the guardian of her husband's home and his children, and she is questioned about them. This is in Bukhari. 
This responsibility implies leadership. It wouldn't be just for you to be questioned and responsible for something and you're not the leader of that. So when we're thinking about manhood and fatherhood and Islam in that household, we're talking about the head of the household responsible for securing and protecting that household, responsible for providing the provisions that are needed for that household. Meaning, not that the woman has no role in that, but he's the one that's going to be questioned about that if it's not taken care of, if the household is not secure, if food is not on the table. He's the one who will be taken to task by Allah. Did you use what I provided you? Your intelligence, your strength, your access to wealth, etc. The other part of the scuba, aside from fatherhood, is freedom. And freedom is actually tied into fatherhood. When we look at just the Webster's definition of being free, uh, it talks about the absence of necessity. It talks about the absence of coercion or constraints in choice or action. It talks about liberation from slavery or restraint from the power of another. Now, I think we can give a whole coupon, don't worry, I want today, on freedom in the, in the introduction to the coupon. I bore witness that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger, the servant, and the slave of Allah. The slave. Allah owns him. Allah owns all of us. So when we talk about freedom, what are we talking about as Muslims? Because the, this gift of life that we have automatically makes us in debt to our Creator. And then on top of him giving us life, he blessed us with hearing, with seeing, with intellect, and on and on. And which of his favors will you deny? Are we free from being in debt to our creator? As Muslims, we recognize no. So when we're talking about freedom as Muslims, we accept and acknowledge and bear witness that we are slaves of Allah, but slaves of Allah only. Only, no one else, no other master, no other owner. Within the society though, when we think about Juneteenth and what it symbolizes here, we have to remember, I have to remind some of us, that the emancipation of the slaves did not bring about their freedom. The chains were taken off of their bodies and they were set free to go make do, but were they free from restraint from the power of another at that time? They were now free to make way and make do and find their survival in a society that was not designed for them to be successful and prosperous in. They were free to go figure it out in a society where at least half of the country was resentful of them for being free, for not being slaves. That for the next hundred years after the Emancipation Proclamation, there were laws put in place designed specifically to limit their economic and political power in this country. Couldn't own easily, couldn't get, didn't have the same access to land, not the same access to education, not the same access to voting, etc. And so, in a sense, this quest for freedom within the, the society was continuing after the Emancipation Proclamation. And a lot of us think that in the civil rights movement that started in the 50s and it culminated in the 60s. We acquired that freedom. Black Americans got that freedom. 
But the reality is the goals of the civil rights movement were never fulfilled. When you look at the history, you'll see the leaders were all killed. They were killed or they left. Many of them went to Africa or they sought political asylum elsewhere. There was never official de uh, declaration that we have achieved our goals, mission accomplished. One of Dr. King Jr.'s last speeches, he said, I think we made a mistake. We've integrated into a burning house. He realized that the March on Washington and the acquisition of voting rights was not even scratching the surface of what black Americans and even poor Americans who were white Americans, Latino, etc., really needed, which was economic power. And when he started talking about redistribution of wealth, when he started talking about actually cutting a check, you know, it doesn't cost anything to let somebody vote. They did all that fighting and protesting and marching just so they could vote. Didn't cost a thing. And it was given begrudgingly. But then when he started talking about economic power, when he started talking about a universal basic income and job access and job training and ownership, he was dead shortly after that. Not a, not a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> but I'm just saying. That was not the popular message. Even white liberals were not rallying behind that message. Freedom in this country is tied to economic power and political power. Because if you don't have either one of those things, then you are then at the will and subject to the power of those who have it. That's been the struggle. That's been the plight. How do we acquire that? And how does this impact fatherhood? The very first ayat, the men are the maintainers and the protectors and the providers for their wives, for their women. How do you do that in a large communal societal setting if you are economically and politically deprived? What does that do to you as a father? How does that impact how you're seen by your women, by your children? And so this is why we should take issue when families in the black community are heavily criticized or fathers in the black community are heavily criticized without a recognition that it is by design. It was by design that they have been undermined. When we think of the parable Allah sets out for us in the Quran of the story of Pharaoh and Musa, alayhi salam, when Pharaoh learned that it would be one of his, someone from his slave class, a man from his slave class was going to raise up and overthrow him, his insecurity, wanting to stay in power, decided he was going to combat that by ordering that all the male children would be killed. Kill the men, spare the women. And this is how he'll stay in power. It was the male that he saw as a threat to his power. When you understand the thinking of white supremacy that formed this nation, that drew racial lines, that it was the white male that was in power, who did he see as a threat to his power? Who did he worry about? If this one ever gets in power, I might be in trouble. He might do to me something similar. He might be after revenge. If you ever get a chance to read some of the writings of J. Edgar Hoover, who was the head of the FBI for decades in this country in the Jim Crow era, the FBI is supposed to be keeping our, our country safe, right, from domestic threats. And so he was spying on Dr. Martin Luther King. How is Dr. King a domestic threat? In documents that have now been declassified, 
He describes Dr. King, Malcolm X, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and other civil rights leaders as the threat of a black messiah. Terms that they use. The fear of a black messiah. Someone who would rally and organize the black Americans to get political and economic power in this country and shift the balance of power. And this is why the FBI dedicated so many resources to undermining these civil rights leaders and these organizations to maintain that status quo. What I'm suggesting to you all today is that struggle for freedom and equality is still ongoing. Well, unless we're no longer struggling and we've just given up. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, ya Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, talk Allah, all you who believe, be mindful of Allah. It's a great sign for us in the fact that Pharaoh called for the slaughter of the males, knowing that this would help him to maintain and establish his power, or so he thought. But we know the story. There was one male that he spared because of the compassion that his wife showed for this baby. And so the one that he spared and allowed to grow up in his home was actually the one that he should have been afraid of. This tells us the irony of this is that Allah's plan wins through ultimately in spite of what they may be planning and what they may do. Whatever Allah's plan is, in the end, it manifests. The story of the black experience is important for all of us living here in America. That's why I'm saying it to a diverse group. Because in it we see how the male figure was attacked as a way of undermining the entire community. And this type of attack is ongoing today and it's not just black families or the black male that is now being targeted. In our popular culture, you'll struggle to find, in TV shows and movies, you'll struggle to find positive real of male figures that are fathers. For every one you might find, there's dozens of others that are ridiculous. The typical caricature of the father is a buffoon, an idiot, someone who is dumbfounded if he's left with the children, incompetent in the kitchen, sort of a goofball. These are the images that we see, the Homer Simpsons of the world, the family guys of the world. These are the images that our children are seeing of what a father is, the role of the father it's been diminished, and it's been diminished in a way that impacts all of us. Not all of us men, but all of us. Because the statistics are clear. When you start looking at the youth and the troubles that they have, whether it's incarceration, whether it's misconduct in school, whether it's early teen pregnancy, all of these get tied to Father issues. Father issues. What was the dad? Either the dad was absent, the dad was abusive, something with the dad. So as we're on this weekend looking forward, Sunday is Father's Day. As Muslims, yes, mothers are in a very honored position. We're all well aware, you know, my mother made sure that I understood paradise lies at the feet of your mother. It's the first hadith I learned. Shortly after that, I learned who do you respect most? Your mother, and then your mother, and then your mother. And the hadith doesn't end there. 
and then your father, and then your father. So the, the high reverence that we place on mothers shouldn't take away from the high reverence that's still due to our fathers. Whether we're fathers or not. And so my final plea to us all is as men, is to step into that role of fatherhood, understanding that if you don't see it as a privilege, see it as a responsibility. The law has put you in this position, in this role. Play that role. Understand you'll be questioned about that role. For those of us who maybe came from households and our fathers were deficient in one way or another, in multiple ways, forgive them. Find a way to forgive them, and then you do better. You be strong where they were weak. You make up for what they couldn't do. For me, being a father gave me compassion for my father. I was like, man, okay, how did he lie? This is, looks different from this side. Have compassion for your fathers and their shortcomings. And then we'll be the fathers for our children. And inshallah, they'll have compassion on us for our shortcomings. For us to honor and respect our fathers and be appreciative of the role that they have to play, of the responsibility and burden that Allah has put on their shoulders, and pray for them that Allah makes that task easy for them. And they can do it in the light of His guidance in the Quran and the Sunnah. In the example of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi we have a beautiful example of a father who was loving to his family, who was kind to his family, who kissed his children, and some of the veteran Arabs were like, what is this? Who cried at the death of his son, and they were like, what is this? As fathers, we're still feeling, we're still loving. We still have mercy. This is part of the sunnah of Rasulullah So may Allah give us the knowledge that we need so that we can fulfill this role. Ameen, Amin, Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Subhana rabbika uradil izzati anna yisifun. Wa salamu ala al-mursaneen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa alhamdulillahi salam. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah.